welcome, welcome to worship as we continue our uh, continue as we follow in the steps of Jesus as we walk through the Passion tonight. Our our service theme is his final steps led to his enemies, and so we see how Jesus, surrounded by them, still still shows love to the very end. We make use of the service of of Compline prayer at the close of day. Rejoice, the Lord is King. is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and one another. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, in our deeds, and in all that we have not done. Forgive us in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Deliver and restore us, that we may rest in peace. By the mercy of God, we are redeemed. 
by Jesus Christ, and in him we are forgiven. Let us rest in his peace until the rising of the sun, when we shall serve him in newness of life. Amen. Our psalm this evening is Psalm 8D, so it is only up on the screens. It is not the Psalm 8 that's in the hymnal. We join in singing together Psalm 8 as it speaks of our God and King as we give him our praise. God, our Father, we praise your name for the marvelous universe you have created, and we pray for humility to understand our role in it. Show us that your Son is the only man who can rule this world with true wisdom and power. Give us full confidence that all things are under the control of Christ, who lives and rules with you and the Holy Spirit as one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue our Passion History reading from Matthew's Gospel. Uh, we read from Matthew 20, chapter 26 again, entitled Gethsemane. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. He went away a second time and prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, May your will be done. When he came back, he again found them sleeping. 
because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. Then he returned to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man, arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus replied, Friend, do what you came for. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? At that time, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat at the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then... All the disciples deserted him and fled. This is, so far, the passion history of our Lord. We continue with the response. is his final steps led to his enemies. But we see not what we read in the Passion history of when his enemies arrested him. We see a couple days earlier as Luke begins and tells us in Luke 20. We'll read from Luke's gospel and, and the words that Jesus said there uh, in a little bit. But first I'd like to ask you, can I ask you to imagine what would you do how would you spend your time that if, after having gone to the hospital for just a, a routine, regular checkup, the doctor came out and told you, you only have one week to live. You are free to go and do whatever you like during the next seven days, as long as you stay within a short walking distance, maybe two miles of the hospital here, until that time when it comes time for your end would you spend your time? What would you do? Really, doesn't that kind of describe what Jesus' final week was? What Holy Week was? Jesus spent that final week all within about a two-mile radius of the temple and Jerusalem. The temple was his father's house, after all, the place where he would be, and Jerusalem was where he would come to his end. So how would you spend your time? Probably doing a lot of the things 
that we hear Jesus did during Holy Week, where his final steps are leading us this Lenten season. Spend time. I think every minute, every second I could to spend time with those who were close to me, my family, my friends. And so Jesus went out each night. He traveled out to Bethany, a little village two miles out of Jerusalem, on the east side of the Mount of Olives. And there he stayed with dear friends of his. You know them, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He might attend parties. Why not? No use just moping around. What's that going to do? And, and in fact, uh, you haven't had it yet. Pastor Reckley preaches. I don't think Pastor Reckley has been here yet. Uh, Pastor Reckley will come and he will preach about the final steps that lead to a dinner celebration at the house of Simon the leper. You want special time with those who were closest to you, no doubt. And so did Jesus. And you know that last night that he was with, he spent with the twelve in that upper room as he drew them in close and he encouraged them words that he says, I regard you not as servants, but as friends. Jesus with his friends, saying how they were not servants. No, no servant knows the master's business, but, but you know everything. I have shared everything with you. And hey, how thankful one of those parting gifts that he gave, he also gives to us in his Holy Supper. Well, the one thing I don't think any of us would do willingly, however, is what our theme for this evening is. Nonetheless, our Lenten meditation this evening is his final steps led to his enemies. Why would you want to spend time near them? But now we first must have to make clear, as you very well know, that Jesus did not feel, Jesus did not nurture hostility to anyone, ever, not ever. Jesus chose, Jesus picked no enemies. His enemies were the ones who harbored hostility toward him. And our passion history isn't full of those kinds of characters. The people who planned and plotted, as we read in the passion history tonight, to arrest Jesus, eventually to condemn him, they, they wouldn't be happy until he was strung up, hung up on a cross. Jesus desired to condemn no one. He was not filled with an ounce of hostility. No, Jesus perfectly, even up until the very end, he walked the walk that he talked about when he said, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And in that, we see here the purest, the most extraordinary display of Christ's love. Love your enemies. It's natural to love those who love you, who are kind and good to you. But to love your enemies, that's how in Jesus' final steps, we see how he fully displays his love as his final steps led to his enemies. And as we construct what we're going to look at tonight, uh, this evening we're considering what happens on what has been called Busy Tuesday. You know, as people kind of break down what happened on Holy Week, uh, characteristic in Jesus' entire ministry, even though he's only four days countdown, four days left, what do we see Jesus doing? He's concerned with meeting the needs of others. On Busy Tuesday, we find Jesus in the temple courts doing what else? What he always did, teaching and preaching the good news to people who were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus, the good shepherd, right up until the end. But going into those temple courts, Jesus also knew that that also led him to his enemies because they certainly would be lurking behind the pillars in every corner. And so Busy Tuesday is also filled up, and we read in the Gospels, in Matthew's Gospels, I think it's maybe three, four chapters at least of, of Jesus' teaching, and 
one after other, each group trying to take one final shot at Jesus to try to give him a trick question that might trip him up. Jesus, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar? Jesus, what about the resurrection? Oh, great teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? But they began, his enemies began by, as that's what we read in Luke chapter 20, by saying, tell us, by what authority? Who gave you this authority? It's not so much a question, is it? It's an accusation. Because the, the leaders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, the elders, they saw themselves that they were the authority of anything that happened in the temple courts. And they did not approve of Jesus. And they wanted to get rid of him as soon as possible, once and for all. So their question, and all the subsequent questions that we read about on Busy Tuesday, were an effort to really backfill the narrative that they were trying to spin about Jesus. To build their case against Jesus, to discredit him, to, to raise suspicion about him, to to give them something, anything, that they could use to bring up on charges to condemn him to death. Well, Jesus responded to their question with a legitimate question. A question that put them on the spot. A, a one that the religious leaders and the teachers of the law, they just could not honestly answer. You see, Jesus' time was not yet. It was only Tuesday, and he was looking forward to a, a dinner date, that intimate dinner date with his closest friends upcoming, that Last Supper. And the Lamb of God, the one who was fulfillment of that Passover lamb, he would not offer himself up, not until it was the time of the Passover celebration on Friday. Well, Jesus went on to tell the people a parable that confirmed everything that his enemies, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders suspected. You know, parable, parable, earthly story with a, a heavenly meaning. And this one spoke squarely, directly against these religious leaders. It was a, a story that laid bare their plans to kill Jesus. It was a story that exposed their blatant opposition to the heavenly father even though they were supposed to be the religious leaders in the land and it convicted them of the selfish self-centered worldly ambitions that govern their lives the parable of the tenants as we find in luke 20 but maybe before we we share jesus telling of that parable uh, maybe as you know jesus parables they always were just ripped from the headlines of everyday life of jewish people and so a little background that in the that area in the good farming areas the upper jordan river the the west coast and the northern coast and really much of galilee in fact um, there contained vast estates that were owned by foreigners who lived in faraway countries their farms and vineyards would be rented out to tenant farmers. Now keep in mind, the, the owners are in a faraway country, and, and so all they're really concerned about is to make sure that the money keeps coming in. Keep the revenue stream coming, and whether you do well or whether you can be prosperous, okay, just as long as I get my fair share, that fair share being the percentage uh, that they had agreed upon on the contract on the lease. Now the owner wouldn't necessarily know if the tenant farmers were being honest. What if they were holding back some of the profits and, and skimming off the top, so to speak? Well, all of Jesus' listeners, including those religious leaders, knew only all too well how this system worked. And then so Jesus told them this parable. A man planted a vineyard rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. He sent another servant, but that one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third. They wounded him 
and threw him out. So the servants who were set to collect that agreed upon percentage that was part of the contract. But did you notice how each time there was an escalation of the violence? They beat and sent away the first. Beat and treated shamefully and sent away the second. And the third, he was beaten so viciously that he couldn't even make it out under his own power. So they threw him out. And then in the most extraordinary display of love, shocking, irrational, reckless love, even wholly undeserved and unwarranted, Jesus goes on. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my son whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. Now you know what's going to happen, right? You can see what's coming, can't you? Now, even according to the laws of the day, under certain conditions, if an owner died, leaving no heir, the claim of the estate could rightly go to those who were currently on the land. They would really have first dibs to keep the land. And so in Jesus' parable, tying into real times, these wicked tenants must have figured out, well, the owner's dead. Why else would the son be here if we kill the son, the vineyard's ours? That's what Jesus said. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. But the owner was not dead. The wicked tenants could not formulate, they could not even begin to imagine the love that would send a one and only son. The love that would send a beloved son to these kinds, such rebels. But that is the Father's love, isn't it? That is your heavenly Father's love. A love that he has always loved with. In the Psalms we read, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, So far has he removed our transgressions from us. How deep the Father's love for us. And like Father, like Son. How many times don't we read in the Gospels as Jesus said, I must do what my Father does. Everything that I've learned from my Father, I have made known to you. And so Jesus taught, love your enemies. And isn't that just what our Savior Jesus did? As his final steps led to his enemies, not on that Tuesday, not on busy Tuesday, it was not time yet, but on Friday, on Good Friday, with his arms stretched out wide upon the cross extended, we see how it is possible for our holy and righteous God to remove our transgressions from us, to remove them as far as from one scarred hand to another. God laid them all on him, on the Passover lamb, on the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All your iniquity was laid on Jesus. And Jesus did it all because He was thinking of you. The Heavenly Father, in his irrational, reckless love, before he did the imaginable in our hearts, what were we? We were enemies of God. As Paul says, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, well, the events of Good Friday... They would bring about the fulfillment of Psalm 18, Jesus told his hearers as he was concluding the the point where this parable was headed. As he said, then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, as Jesus quoted Psalm 118. The builders 
the builders for God's people, you would think they were the chief priests, the teachers of the law, the elders. They were the people in position and power and responsibility to use and entrust with God's word to care for the people, to point them to eagerly await that coming Messiah. But these builders rejected Jesus. And now it's interesting, that word rejected that's used there in the psalm it talks about to reject after examination. These religious leaders daily heard Jesus teach and preach at the temple courts. He reminded them when they came to arrest him, I was with you every day. His final steps led to his enemies. They witnessed the miracles. Their hearts were pricked when Jesus told them and spoke directly to them, and they knew it. But they refused to turn and repent. And instead, they rejected him. They had that prized, precious stone. They could roll it round in their hands, and then they just tossed it over on the reject pile. Like the wicked tenants in the parable, they would throw the beloved son out of the vineyard. And on a hill outside Jerusalem, they crucify him. His final steps led to his enemies. And Jesus knew all along what he was doing. He was in complete command and control every step of the way. Busy Tuesday was not yet his time. And when it appeared that his enemies had gained the upper hand on him, it was only in order that he could fulfill Scripture. Jesus' suffering and dying on the cross fulfilled God the Father's plan of salvation, that the Lord would lay on him the iniquity of us all, as as Isaiah looked forward to it and saw through those eyes of faith. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought him peace, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. Make no mistake, Jesus Christ is the only Savior that this world will ever have. Christ Jesus himself is the chief cornerstone. To believe in him is salvation. To reject and deny God's chosen cornerstone, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. That is to remain under God's righteous condemnation. Trust him. Trust Jesus, who to the very end loved his enemies and welcomes all who come to him. Amen. We respond with our our next hymn, hymn 611, Joyously I'll Praise My Savior as we sing of all the great things that Jesus, our Savior, has done for us.
are abundant and gracious beyond our imagination. We thank you for all the gifts you give. Every good and perfect gift comes from you, but especially the gift of your one and only Son. Use these gifts that we might share that message that others too would know of Jesus' love. We continue with the prayers, page 228 and on the screen.
the almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless us and keep us. Amen. Amen. I invite you to join in our closing hymn, hymn 787.